Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you to the second in the new series of uh, virtual ICM seminars in computer and computational science. My name is Marek Michalewicz. I'm the director of ICM. ICM stands for Interdisciplinary Center for Mathematical and Computational Modeling. University of Warsaw. And it's a great pleasure today to welcome uh, our friend Professor Ero Gelembe, who is a uh, professor at the Institute of uh, Theoretical and Applied Informatics, Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, CNRS uh, I3S Laboratory, University of Côte d'Azur, France, and a uh, visiting professor at the uh, Imperial College. Um, Professor Galembe has a very distinguished career in computer science and uh, I encourage you all to consult the more comprehensive, although still very short, uh, bio which is uh, presented at our uh, seminars website. Suffice it to say that uh, Professor Galembe is the citizen of the world. As uh, was born in Turkey, received the uh, education in, in various places, spent many years teaching and researching in the United States, in Belgium, in the UK, in France, in Poland. Uh, has got a very long list of accolades and uh, achievements. Uh, Fellowship, so, so it's, it's incredibly uh, distinguished uh, career with uh, with great uh, many uh, very important achievements, uh, research contributions, contributions to our understanding of uh, various uh, aspects of uh, computational systems, mathematics of computing, algor of algorithmics. And the list is very long, and I don't want to take too much time from, from this uh, very exciting lecture that Professor Galenda will be presenting in just in, mo in a moment. Uh, for the last several years, Professor Galenda uh, focused his attention of, on, uh, on continuation of his work on networks, on G networks, uh, named so after his name, and also on energy aware, cloud computing, uh, self aware networks and cybersecurity. You will hear some of it, uh, I hope, in, in this lecture. And uh, since this is uh, the uh, last seminar, second and last seminar, just before Easter, I wish uh, all uh, participants uh, all the best for this uh, uh, holiday season in most countries that uh, uh, we all will have a few days of, of rest or time for with family so i wish you all uh, you have a great time and uh, keep safe and uh, right now i welcome professor galenda uh, to deliver his uh, his lecture thank you very much uh, hello uh, I guess I'm uh, I'm uh, doing this for the first time, and I'm using the system for the first time. Uh, so uh, you will kindly excuse my uh, uh, my uh, um, incompleteness in uh, technique uh, for pre talking uh, in this particular context. Uh, I'm uh, talking to you from my apartment in Paris, in my office in Paris uh, at home. Um, and uh, this afternoon we had a, uh, the morning and the afternoon I was actually attending an online meeting of the French Engineering Academy uh, and one of the questions was a bit related to uh, cybersecurity uh, because it dealt with uh, fake news uh, which is one, one element especially when uh, fake news is organized systematically and not just someone saying something but actually something distributed over a large number of blogs which are 
uh, perhaps uh, not all truthful or which are automatically designed to make a point and to push opinions in some directions as we've seen in recent uh, in recent months and recent years uh, but before i get started uh, i would first of all uh, very much like to thank marek who was very kind to introduce me and actually to invite me i'm also thanking christoph who with whom i've interacted for a few times on the last couple of days to prepare this this event to see how i could i could access the system and use it and i'm very uh, grateful to him for having helped me out and of course i'm especially grateful to marek for this very uh, exaggerated and exaggeratedly complimentary introduction uh, thank you very much uh, before uh, i get started uh, on my slides I would like to um, pass a video, uh, which is the one marked MP4, dot MP4. And you'll see me again a little while ago. Uh, could you start? Oh, do I pass it myself? Perhaps I do. Okay, so this a is a cyber BBC attack which news, hit organizations uh, around the world yesterday London, is being brought under ago. control according to security analysts. Among the institutions affected were the Ukrainian Central Bank, the British advertising agency WPP, and the Port of Rotterdam. Researchers say they've developed a program that can protect individual computers, although it can't stop the bug from spreading. Let's talk to Professor Errol Galembe, who is from Imperial College London and is the college's lead on a European project to enhance cyber security. Good evening to you. Good evening. Hello. Uh, you, you, what, what is your take on, uh, on the, the, the scale of this, how damaging it was, and I suppose brutally, uh, whether we are going to keep seeing attacks like this? Definitely. We're going to see many more attacks like this, unfortunately, for a while. Uh, as you know, across the world, tens of countries are each training hundreds of cybersecurity specialists. Now, depending on who, uh, every year, actually. So depending on uh, who these people are employed by, uh, they will be either attacking or defending or doing both uh, in the organizations where, where, where they will be working. So this, there is a major spread of knowledge about cybersecurity. And in this particular attack, uh, the operating system was manipulated. Uh, the operating system is uh, the part of a computer system which actually has access to all of the resources. Uh, it's a complex piece of software. And through reverse engineering, uh, one can determine which parts of it can be asked to, for instance, attack the machine uh, where the operating system is supposed to do useful work. So uh, these things are bound to happen. And what's very interesting is that um, in this particular case, a technique very similar to advertising has been used. So the attack has spread very widely in order to catch as many organizations and people as possible. And uh, one of the outcomes, of course, of these kinds of attacks is ransom. A ransom paid through cryptocurrencies. So I think as all of this world spreads out and, and generalizes, we're, we're bound to see more of it, unfortunately. And, and so uh, clearly you're outlining that countries, people, are, uh, security analysts are, are trying to, to find ways to counter this. Are, are those people always going to be on the back step, back foot rather? Are, are, are the hackers, dare I suggest, suggest always one step ahead? Or, or do you have a little more optimism than that? to say is that the hackers and the defenders are the same people. Uh, so you're talking about the same kind of competence. So the people who are, for instance, spending a lot of time understanding how systems can be protected are exactly the same people who are in the same process, understanding how systems can be attacked. So uh, it's just a matter of, you know, are you allowed to do this or not? And unfortunately, at the international level, there isn't any real legislation that stops, for instance, governments from uh, doing these kinds of things. They will always be denied, of course, but we don't have international regulations. We don't have something like the UN Disarmament Agency uh, or organizations that say what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do as a government. So uh, it all ends up being, uh, you know, uh, initiatives being taken right and left. Uh, but it is unfortunately exactly the same level of competence that's needed for effic efficient defense as it is for efficient attack. 
Professor Errol Galembe, it's really, really good of you to talk to us. Uh, I fear there are so many more questions I would love to ask you, but thank you so much for your time, and uh, I fear we will be discussing this again anyway. But thank you very much for now from Imperial College London. Thank you. Okay, so back to me. And uh, uh, the points, let me just go over what I was saying uh, concerning cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity is a systemic issue. It's a, it's, it's a broad systemic issue for um, computer systems, networks, and so on. So as a systemic issue, it's not uh, something that is resolved by, say, cryptography. Cryptography handles a particular question uh, within uh, the broad issue of cybersecurity, which is, you know, can we encrypt data and how effective are we at doing that? And usually, uh, cyber attacks do not address, do not target the cryptographic aspects. They target other, much simpler things to deal with. I think cryptography is just fine. Uh, the problem is elsewhere, generally, with regard to cybersecurity. And with respect to the particular event, uh, that was being talked about on this news, uh, BBC Evening News at five o'clock in London. I was called into a studio, you know, they called me in the afternoon and a, a few minutes later I was in the studio trying to answer questions to this lady uh, in a kind of very impromptu way, so it wasn't at all prepared. As you can probably notice from the way I, I said these things, it wasn't prepared, it was just, she, I didn't know what her questions were going to be and I was just answering them. And the um, at that time, the cyber attack was WannaCry. I don't know if you've heard about it. Now, basically, what, what had been done in WannaCry is that people had gotten access to the operating system at the operating system level and had locked a certain number of databases on the systems. They had, in fact, encoded them and, and, and locked the access to these databases um, at a distance, so they had gotten onto systems, gotten around the protection schemes, and had locked, essentially, access of the legitimate users. So the le legitimate users were left out. And the purpose was to have the legitimate users pay ransom uh, to these people who were doing it. Now, I won't comment on who was doing this, but there's, there are various theories about this, and at least various solid or non-solid theories about who was doing this, but uh, it was probably governmental, uh, very likely a governmental attack. And the locking uh, actually addressed some very key systems around the world. One of these, for instance, was the NHS. Now, NHS is where? NHS is a national health service in the UK. And some of their servers were locked. And as a result, I mean, the access to the data and so on, as, as a result, many um, uh, serious interventions, surgeries, you know, operations uh, on patients had to be uh, put off, had to be retarded by several days because of this attack, because they couldn't get all the data on the patient and prepare all the steps that were necessary to the surgery. Now, imagine if today, with the crisis we're having in countries like France, the UK, even worse, Italy, and so on, imagine if we had this kind of successful attack on systems and what the kind of havoc it could create on the systems that are dealing with, you know, it would, it would be an additional horrible kind of problem to deal with for the national health services. So uh, this is this is a context. Now, one thing there that I'm saying, and I try to repeat it to this lady, because uh, of course uh, the lady at the BBC, she's not aware of uh, what are the competences involved. And basically, you know, um, I know a country where there are two offices, two, de two government departments, okay? Uh, they are at um, some few hundred meters away from each other. One of these government departments is specialized in attacking and hacking. Uh, I'm talking about Western country, okay, that I will not name. The other government department is uh, specialized in uh, defending, okay? Uh, the people recruited to the these two parts are basically people with the same background, the same technical background. They're recruited from the same schools, same universities. And uh, some of them in their career, they become, you know, um, uh, they work as specialists in the attack department. Then they become head of department in the, inside the uh, uh, defense department. Then they go over to the other side and they become like uh, chief of the section 
for the, <laughs> the defense part and they go over to so basically what i was telling her was absolutely absolute truth which is not apparent <laughs> to many people who uh, you know deal with these questions and are uh, uh, have to take on the consequences of this so uh, the idea that we're going to all of a sudden have a magic solution to our cybersecurity problems is of course an illusion and we just have to consider that this is something that continues and we have to take it in a certain sense a bit lightly because it's not going to disappear all of a sudden uh, this year it's going to be this attack next year it's going to be another one and these things are going to go, go on for a while so uh, now i've given you a little bit my perspective about this i think it's a for me cybersecurity is very much of a a quality of service issue or quality of experience issue. We have to, uh, of course, have in our systems, in the systems that we build, we must have schemes, uh, mechanisms, algorithms, software that is going to be able to uh, watch over the system and detect uh, these attacks as soon as possible. And then uh, these parts which de are detecting the attacks should be able to communicate with the other algorithms and software and so on, whose role is to mitigate, I don't say eliminate, that's too beautiful, too wonderful to happen, but uh, whose role will be to mitigate these attacks, that is to um, make it so that uh, the effect of the attacks is uh, not so much observed, it's not felt as much as it would have been without the mitigation part and without the detection part, so the, their role is to, okay, fine, we will uh, detect them, then we will mitigate them, and then we will keep on watching for other attacks. And as I talk about that, I would like to pass the, before I go into my slides, you see I spend a lot of time outside of slides here, uh, as I would do in my uh, lectures, you know, standard lectures, I don't like formal kind of cold square presentations. I, I want to be a bit more alive. So I will pass the second video that's there. So uh, what I'm trying to show now is uh, what actually happens uh, adaptively uh, in, in a system which is always trying to preserve uh, the communications and is always trying to, sh to pr preserve communications in the presence of a worm attack. So uh, this is not a simulation, it is actually a measurement sequence on a test bed okay so you see that there's a test bed with roughly 35 40 machines uh, which are uh, routers okay and um, there are uh, color-coded lines that you notice for instance a bright green line a dark green line a yellow line etc and these are connections so connections go over multiple hops right so the connections are going over several machines and you see certain crosses and these red crosses and the red crosses they're either on the links or they're on the nodes and they represent blockages that have been created by the worm that propagates from node to node at the same time so these blockages are happening but at the same time you see that right now for instance the blockages have been eliminated. Why? Because the worms were detected and a patching program was started at a certain number of nodes which had been contaminated and now the attack is beginning again. So you'll see a cycle of attack spreading and then patching and the connections are re-established and uh, then of course uh, the cycle begins again, you know, patching then recontamination, then patching, and then recontamination. Well, what's, what's special about this video? What is special about this experiment? What is very special about this experiment is not the fact that there's a worm that spreads, nor that there is patching. Uh, what is special is that the paths, the, for instance, bright green line, or the dark blue line, or the yellow line, is not going through the same nodes. So we don't just have a detection going on, we also have a mitigation going on. And the mitigation is not just 
patching. The mitigation is rerouting. So as soon as we detect that something is wrong, we are the system, I say we, but the system is autonomously selecting new paths so that it tries to preserve as much as possible the system's functions while it is being attacked. So this is exactly what I mean by mitigation. Mitigation is not just repair, do something brutal and repair. It is adapt to the attack situation and try to make the system work as well as possible until the actual patching can happen. Now, on the right-hand side, I was just what I talked about is on the left-hand side of the screen. Okay, on the right-hand side of the screen, you have two quality of service metrics. I said my view of cybersecurity is a question of being able to preserve quality of service. It's not just to go after the bad guys. It is essentially to preserve quality of service even when the bad guys are around. So to preserve your capacity to function in an unstopped, unstoppable mode, even when the bad guys are coming along. And this is exactly what is happening on the right hand side. You see two standard quality of service metrics for networks. The above curve shows the delay. The below curve shows the jitter, the second moment related to delay. So what you're seeing is that basically, even though during an attack, uh, let me pass this again, during an attack, the uh, delay is going to grow. Uh, later on, it's going to, uh, it's going to grow, but you are still conducting the color codes on the right-hand side, the colors that you see on the right-hand side, for instance, the bright green, is the same as the color code on the left-hand side, which shows the path. On the right-hand side, you see the quality of service. On the left-hand side, you see the path. And the moral of the story, I mean, the message, the take-home message, is that the mitigation is preserving quality of service. Right now, there's an attack is very bad, but everyone's running around the attack, you know, choosing other paths to avoid the ones that are attacked. And therefore, they are preserving the delay continues, continues to be finite, and the jitter also continues to be finite. Now, what's also interesting is that this is not going to be perfect. So sometimes the communication lines are broken. And you see this very, very clearly in the light purple, light violet, violet color, purple color on the top. You see a point which is by itself and to its right, there is nothing going on. So that is telling you that that line has been broken. And now all of a sudden it's picked up again because further down the line, you see that the same purple line has started continuing with new data points. So moral of the story, there are going to be attacks, perhaps all the time, hopefully not too frequently, but we have to detect them and we have to mitigate them and we have to do this adaptively. Now this philosophy, I think you will see in a certain number of the other results I will be showing you in my slides. Uh, fine. So um, uh, let me just, I'm kind of summarizing so far what I've said. Um, cyber attacks are around. They'll, they target our societal infrastructures, our democracy, our political systems, uh, our health systems like the WannaCry, our transporta transportation systems, energy, finance, education, manufacturing, Supply chains, which are very important, are very susceptible to attacks. So they're there, okay? Uh, so why are they uh, such a prevalent uh, issue in our systems? What's such a prevalent nuisance? Well, as you know, the internet uh, was designed as a research project, okay? And um, uh, clearly, uh, it, everything was not thought out perfectly. And the basic protocols that we have, where we have very few controls on who can access the internet. I mean, there's very little uh, checking out about uh, who can access and what provenance and what are, not just who can access, but what happens if uh, they do bad things. I mean, the worst that happens is they cancel your email account. That's not great. So um, the origin content of traffic is not easily identified and traced and uh, security and so on was not really present uh, at the beginning. Uh, let's go on. And uh, the other thing is, of course, 
we have an expanding population of experts who are being trained in attack and defense and, and in computer science in general. Okay? And unfortunately, uh, these people will end up, depending on uh, who they're working for, uh, they'll be ending up either attacking and def or defending. Hopefully more people are defending than people attacking, but you never know. And we really don't have international agreements and regulations. Now, with the Internet of Things coming along, it can only get worse. I mean, uh, <laughs> these things are e going to become even worse because uh, with the Internet of Things, you can potentially, suppose someone is uh, attached to a um, automatic syringe, uh, automatic injection system that injects, uh, uh, I don't know, insulin into the person's uh, bloodstream. Well, basically, uh, if you're not careful, the IoT, and if it's connected to the IoT, the system can, uh, can kill the person. So uh, at some point, I wouldn't be surprised if we can see, so if we, find, we will discover that there have been some cyber murders, that people have actually been, been bumped off in a certain sense by uh, cyber attacks. In a way, it has already happened. You know, I'm not saying anything out of science fiction, uh, using, for instance, um, mobile phones to track vi people very carefully and then to shoot a rocket at their car, which is something that several governments are doing today uh, around the world. Well, this is a form of, you know, killing using uh, uh, cyber features. So it's a form of cyber attack because most of this is conducted uh, through computer systems and networks. Uh, and the last part where you just throw the rocket at the, at the car or at the house or whatever is just the last step. All the rest, all the rest is cyber. So, uh, and you could imagine, for instance, that people would take precautions, would use cyber measures to try to protect themselves against even this kind of attack. So, um, uh, this is great. However, defending yourself against cyber attacks also requires you to be very careful about not creating too many false alarms. So any detection scheme has a side effect, which is the, if you wish, the false alarm aspect. And uh, I will be mentioning that in the, in the, next, uh, in the next slides. Uh, let me see where I am. I'm here. Uh, so um, uh, the current, the way forward, okay, detect attacks. Uh, try to uh, use good detection mechanisms, try to reduce uh, the um, false alarms, um, and do your detection in a, not just at one point, but you're, you do your detection across your system, because don't wait for the thing to have arrived to the key point to start doing detection. You have to really do detection way beyond where you are to collect data to see whether potentially you're under threat. And then the counterpart of this, of course, is to create stable networks. When I use here the term networks in, term, in a global way, uh, a network has data centers, has clouds, has uh, fog components, has, has servers, has routers, has base stations, and so on. So we want to create stable networks despite the attacks that are happening. And we have to have response mechanisms which are basically autonomic which are not based on someone deciding, but which are built into the system and which re react dynamically to, uh, to attacks. So now let's be a bit more concrete. Okay. As I was saying, uh, many attacks are extremely simple. Uh, and uh, generally, attacks exploit uh, characteristics of systems uh, these characteristics have been built into the systems for, for some very good reason. They are uh, characteristics that have been built there for a functional reason, and they are then used by attackers to exploit weaknesses of the system. And let me give you a very, very trivial example from mobile telephony. Okay. Uh, you may or may not be aware of this, but suppose you set up a mobile connection, for instance, to, mo to download some data, and then you don't download the data. After some time, there'll be a timeout that will throw you out of the system, right? Your mobile phone will be thrown out of the system 
because it's not doing what it's supposed to do. They'll say, well, this, this is nonsense. I mean, it's taking up bandwidth, using up energy of a mobile phone, and it's also taking up bandwidth of the network uh, because they're blocking bandwidth for their connection and they're not using it. So you're thrown out, okay? You have a timeout mechanism. This is something that also existed in the very, very old telephone systems. In the very old systems, there was something called, you know, you'd dial a number and you'd get a blocked line message. Doot, 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 as if your correspondent <laughs> was busy. It wasn't your correspondent that was busy. It was the switches or one of the switches in between you and the correspondent that were ex excessively loaded. And they were creating a tone just to protect themselves for, from additional load. So the purpose was not to uh, tell you that the correspondent was busy. That's what they made you think. But the reality was the correspondent might well have been not busy at all, but that the switch was too busy and was protecting itself from uh, this communication. So in this context, if you think of what the uh, modern mobile network is doing, it's a, roughly the same thing. It's throwing you out because it's trying to save energy and it's trying to uh, also uh, save bandwidth that it can allocate or sell to someone else. And uh, attacks against this have been mounted very, very effectively, and they're called signaling attacks. If you look at single ad attacks on mobile telephones, you can find traces of this, you know, traces, I mean, full traces of measurements on this uh, online. So this is something that's very well known that many mobile operators have, have noticed. Uh, what is the purpose of these signaling attacks? The signaling attacks are not attacks actually on the end user, okay? Not direct attacks on the end user. They're attacks actually which aim the mobile operator. And uh, so why do they harm, how, how are they harming the mobile operator? Well, a couple of things. First of all, these signaling attacks will have an effect of giving the mobile operator a bad reputation as not having enough capacity, okay? And secondly, they will force the mobile operator to spend more money on electrical energy. You may not know this, but a large part, perhaps 50, perhaps more percent of a mobile operator's operating costs, day-to-day -day operating costs are in electricity. So if you increase that by 5%, 10%, it makes a huge difference in hundreds of millions of euros. So um, the uh, purpose of the attack is not necessarily to attack the end user, no one cares about the end user anyway at that level. Uh, they're trying to create difficulties for a particular operator who may be a competitor or uh, who may be located in a country that this other attacker, who's probably an institutional attacker, is trying to disrupt, okay, or trying to create problems for them. And it's very cheap, it's very easy to do. So how do you do that? Well, this kind of attack, signaling attack, is exploiting uh, this uh, time constant, which is called a timeout, the timeout in the signaling system of the mobile operator. The timeout throws out the call, the attempted call, if the attempted call doesn't use bandwidth uh, of the system. So, some, so the, the, the signaling attack simulates a call, which then stays on and doesn't do anything. At that point, the mobile operator's system itself automatically disconnects this call. And the call, which is part of the attack, and of course there are hundreds of these, uh, in an attack there are hundreds of these calls playing that game. And this call then repeats its call, has the repeated call syndrome, which is also very well known in telephony. Okay, when you have repeated calls, you can have an overload of the system. So this is happening. And what you see here, you have time along the x-axis. You have load in messages per second. Uh, by messages per second, I mean messages that the signaling system inside the mobile telephone, telephone systems cloud or switch or specialized server have to process. And you see uh, that the storm starts with more and more calls, 
repeated calls. It goes up. And then there's mitigation. Mitigation is, of course, not something that the attacker does, but that the operator system should be doing. Often it doesn't do it, but that it should be doing. And the mitigation will then throttle the attack. And this is on the left-hand side, you have an average type of behavior. And on the right-hand side, you have the actual jagged traffic, the actual traffic load shown with all of its kind of time-dependent changes. Okay? I hope you've understood what the, what the mechanism is. So how do you mitigate this? So we know what the attack is and how do you mitigate it? And the mitigation system, okay, is based essentially on uh, choosing some kind of optimum, first of all, on choosing some kind of optimum value of the timeout. Over here, you have a log-log scale. So if it were on a linear scale, it would look much worse, right? Uh, but this is a log-log scale. And on the left-hand side, the y-axis represents the number of calls or false calls, because a lot of these are not real calls, a lot of false calls that the system is handling. And on the right-hand side, it shows you how uh, the uh, rejection and timeout can be used to lower the effect of the attack. Uh, if you look here on the next slide, uh, you have uh, uh, what kind of, of detection scheme you could use. Well, it turns out that, uh, again, on the left-hand side, you see how effective the mitigation scheme has been, and you see the number of calls that the system is handling. Okay, and um, on the so you have the blue line here, which represents the number of calls, and the small n uh, value on the x-axis, okay, is zero, two, four, etc., is the threshold, which is used to say at that point, if I've noticed, I don't know, like it says here, if I've noticed five repeated calls, which is where the minimum is, um, then I consider that uh, there's been an attack. So by counting the number of repeated calls, you can actually decide, make a choice. Is this an attack or not? Of course, you're going to have false alarms, but you decide whether this is an attack or not. And at the end of the day, you minimize the effect the attack has on the operator. Again, the operator's purpose is not to protect the user in this case. The operator's purpose is to protect itself, its signaling system. Because if its signaling system is overloaded, the whole system goes down. Forget it. The signals, signaling system is the brain of the um, is, is simply the brain of the telephone system. So if that's not working, nothing else will work. So its first priority is to uh, uh, make this change and be able to detect uh, and then to reject a call and never accept it again if uh, it has at any time exceeded a certain number of repeated calls. Okay. So this is quite interesting uh, because it gives you an idea uh, about uh, how these things work and how they can be mitigated. So there you have a very simple, what I've shown you is a very simple example, uh, but very real. These are again measurements on a real system. And this uh, was work we, that we carried out in the uh, project called Nemesis. Uh, FP7 project Nemesis in collaboration with uh, Telecom Italia um, uh, was our uh, one of our industry partners in that project. Uh, Cosmote, uh, the uh, Greek telephone operator, <coughs> was another of our partners in this project. So it was a very interesting project where I was coordinator and I discovered all these things. And uh, we developed some original methods like the one I described. I mean, that was published and this was actually an original method. It wasn't what we suggested, it was not something the operators were doing. As we were going into this, <clears throat> as we were doing this project, we also looked at uh, other techniques um, uh, where we were looking at um, um, uh, the uh, statistical techniques of the, of the data. Uh, statistical techniques applied to the data so that we could determine whether an attack was going on or not. And we, uh, one thing we did was a law, there's a law called uh, Taylor's Law, 
which is uh, a, a, an empirically observed law, for instance, about uh, how, um, how many uh, pigeons uh, or birds, uh, set, Taylor was uh, uh, often in a lot of these statistics, you have to have people who have a lot of time to waste. Uh, and they're very often, uh, they, in the 19th century, Taylor was a 19th century person, Taylor was a 19th century priest in England. So, you know, between Sundays, and he was in a small place, he had that good education, probably Oxford or Cambridge, but he was sitting in a small village, perhaps, with a church to look after, and there were probably 100 people in the village, or perhaps 200. So he didn't have much work. So he was counting the number of birds in a field and how they were spreading across the field. So he said, well, uh, the, he observed in many contexts like that, he observed a linear relationship uh, between averages and uh, certain uh, aspects uh, and variances. So he, he was looking at that and he had some interesting insight. So we applied Taylor's law to the data associated with, uh, with uh, attacks. And we saw that on the left hand side you have a normal normal traffic on the right hand side you have attack tra normal traffic containing attack traffic and we see that in a certain sense if we see a variation with respect to taylor's law it's also an indication of uh, of, a, of a potential attack so that's kind of amusing to find out these these strange relationships uh, perhaps i'll just stop and see if there are any questions uh, with respect to the past, because from now on I'll go quite fast and, and then conclude. I'll just stop for a few minutes, uh, one or two minutes, see if there are any questions. I saw yes. four chats. We have yes. one question. Yes. Could this methodology be used for logistic problem of supply? This is a question from the previous time you've asked if there are any questions. Right. Uh, uh, now, uh, of course, uh, rerouting supply chains is certainly possible, uh, but not everywhere. So for instance, if you're going from a train to a ship and then to another port, and then you move on to another ship and so on, I think they were thinking about that. Um, if they're looking at supply chains from a actual physical perspective, where they would do rerouting, uh, certainly. Of course, it cannot, in, in a network, you can reroute from any node in the network. Of course, it depends on the protocol that you're using, but if you have, say, an SDN, software defined network you can so SDN can change routes in the network dynamically from any node uh, but then you'd say well in, in a supply chain you may not be able to do this because you decide to change from this ship to that ship rather than to this ship then uh, <laughs> then perhaps that ship is not going to accept it for you I mean it's not like a, another router that accepts traffic so you'd have to look at this from a systemic view and see whether it's possible now the other thing of course is that supply chains there's also a whole issue of keeping track of the supply chain. And there, there are very interesting attack and defense aspects that we're actually studying in my current project, which I'm coordinating, called SER IoT. Uh, and I'll say a few more things about SER IoT as, as we go along. Uh, so did I answer the question or not? I cannot um, see the chats myself, so... Uh, yes, yes, we have the confirmation that you have answered the question, and we have another question for the current... Uh, okay, go ahead. Yes, yes. Have the findings in mobile networks been impl implemented in practice? They have been moved on. The way it works, I don't know whether, you know, in telephony, uh, you have very strong standards. So... Uh, Usually, it's not just one operator that uses something, but all a large number of operators, and they have to agree on doing it. Uh, so uh, the process for doing this is through standards bodies. So this point has been moved to a standardization stage. So in a certain sense, quote unquote, it has been included into the thinking for future systems. So we have tested it in one system, However, it has been moved into the standardization phase for future systems. I think that's, that's the answer. And what I'll do now, since uh, we don't have a tremendous amount of time, when do we stop? Do I have about 15 minutes? 
Um, yes, yes. Approximately 15. Yes, exactly. Okay. So let me... Um, uh, uh, okay. Uh, perhaps go through another example uh, related to detection uh, so that you uh, have some sense of this. And this is for a class of attacks which are very common. I mean, the previous one uh, that I presented, the first one I presented in the videos was a worm spreading in the system. The second one I presented was on the uh, so -called storm attacks, telephone systems, uh, which have a particular behavior of, the, uh, of uh, phony false uh, calls, which uh, connect, you know, they, they act as real calls, they connect to the system, they don't use the, the resource, which, which then pushes the mobile phone to kick them off, and then they immediately come back and re reproduce this behavior. So this, is the, this was the second type of attack. And the third attack uh, I'll be presenting you is something everyone is familiar with, which is denial of service. Uh, denial of service in its simplest form is just excessive traffic which is directed by many bots towards one or more targets okay, in the network. So the targets are end users, they can be routers, and one or more bots in the network is generating traffic going at that node. Now, um, the uh, approach uh, that we proposed uh, for, uh, and we're not the only ones that have had this idea, is to uh, look at the histogram of the traffic. And online, you can find a lot of examples of uh, traffic uh, concerning denial of service attacks. It's the oldest type of attack that's been examined, that has been analyzed. So there's a lot of data available. So uh, you have uh, the histogram of normal traffic and you have the histogram of attack traffic. And you can use uh, standard um, signal processing, you know, techniques that come from Bayesian estimation or signal processing, uh, used very commonly in signal processing, about looking at likelihood ratios. You know, how different, basically, you're looking at how different the likelihood ratios are in one case and in the other, and you use the difference between the two or the ratio between the two to determine whether uh, you're having an attack or not. So, I just wanted to show some results. Uh, and uh, the, uh, these um, uh, just show you results of different methods, okay, so that you have a sense of uh, what was, uh, what's done and what's possible and what kind of results you get. Okay, so here we are. And um, if you look at different methods, so, you know, there are methods based on likelihood ratios, methods based on um, feed forward. Uh, machine learning techniques where you use uh, the uh, data from normal traffic and from attack traffic, you use it to train networks, train a network, a uh, neural network. In this case, it's a special kind of network called the random neural network, but anyway. Uh, so uh, you look at uh, the effect of uh, uh, likelihood ratios, you look at the effect of feed forward neural networks and recurrent networks. And what is being shown here is um, uh, whatever is above, you see the second picture, you see on top, you see average late likelihood ratio, and then you see the feed forward neural network, then you see a recurrent network, which is a more complex network structure, and you see a difference between the two in recognizing normal traffic. And the difference uh, is shown in the dots which are above the line, that is the measurement points which are above the threshold, because any detection technique will have a threshold which is some kind of robustness, you know, how, what, what do I accept and why, what do I reject? So anything above here, the tra traffic is normal, so anything that appears above this threshold is what you might call false alarms, okay? They're false alarms because we're saying it's wrong, but it's actually right. And you see that the recurrent network, which is a more complex structure, is getting you a better result with respect to this. And the next slide uh, looks at attack traffic, and you see the likelihood ratio, and again, you see how the likelihood ratio rises and says um, uh, the, uh, uh, when it says correct detections on, in the writing, it means it has correctly detected attacks, not correctly detected normal traffic. It's correctly detected attacks. So the, the likelihood ratio is not giving you false alarms, and it's giving you a correct detection ratio of 80%. 
Now you might say, how wonderful, no false alarms, correct detection of 80%. Well, this is bad. This is bad because you want to have correct detection of 90, 95%, 95%, or above 95%. This is what you want when you're detecting attacks, okay? And in this case, all of the traffic is attacked. So this is really bad performance, the first one that you see with the likelihood ratio. Then you have the feed-forward neural network, which gives you high correct detection, 96%. That's wonderful. But the false alarms are terrible. That means that 20%, nearly 20%, or 15 16%, 17% of false alarms, so for, say 17% of the time, it's giving you uh, an attack when there is no attack, because the, the attack traffic contains sequences, instance, when everything is normal. Now, if you have the, um, uh, uh, the recurrent network, a more complex system, you're seeing that the false alarms have dropped to 5%, and the correct detection is up to 96%. Well, this is the kind of, of performance that we want. The kind of performance that we want is very close to 100%, correct? And close to 0% false alarm but not zero percent. You're always going to have some false alarms. And this is the price that you pay for protecting yourself. Sometimes you're going to be too cautious and you're going to say, oh, there's an attack. But in fact, there isn't. OK, so uh, we see similar things here. Uh, more data like that and more evaluations of this kind. So the purpose of my showing you these particular slides was to show you what we're trying to do in detection. Uh, what we're trying to do in detection is to have, sorry about the movements, I'm just putting my uh, power plug back into my computer, which it dropped. So we're trying to have situations where our false alarms are low, and if possible, our correct, detec our correct uh, detections are high. But of course, this ratio will also depend very much on the mix of traffic. You know, how mixed is the traffic in the same traffic how much is there which is actually um, uh, uh, normal traffic and how much is there which is false alarm. So I will go uh, very quickly uh, to the final part. Um, uh, the, um, in, uh, before I do that, in a very similar vein, uh, we had looked, developed, we developed for a project, uh, again in the EU project uh, called GHOST, we developed a technique. Uh, this one has been actually incorporated into a gateway, an IoT gateway, uh, for the Televes company uh, that is a specialized uh, uh, IoT company uh, that operates in northern Spain. Uh, so in Santiago de Compostela, in that area, immediately next to near Santiago. So uh, we developed a technique based on a recurrent network, neural network for detecting attacks. And um, uh, this is the kind of um, performance that we get. This illustrates the performance. Uh, these are another form of attack called the SYN attacks. Uh, and the gateway, it's a very simple attack for the attacker. And it's not so easy to detect at the, <laughs> at the other end. So we built a neural network based algorithm, which is based on the idea is to have uh, the network only learn normal traffic to kind of become a specialist of normal traffic and reject anything that is not normal. OK, which is what you're seeing here, basically two runs of, of uh, results. And this is uh, on the left hand side is the real time time dependent uh, trace of the recommendations of the system. And on the right-hand side, you have what we call the um, uh, receiver operating curve, the one people doing signal processing are familiar with these or doing statistics. Uh, the x-axis is the false positive rates, the false alarms, and the y-axis is the correct detection, the detection probability, okay? So this gives you an idea about the, another idea about these issues of detections and false alarms. Let me go a little bit beyond and again, I'm going to be uh, schematic in my uh, presentation because I've come to the end. Now, this is a current, our current project, SRIOT, that I'm coordinating. It's a 5 million EU project. 
uh, among our partners. We have Deutsche Telekom. Uh, we have uh, a company called Technalia that does um, automated control of cars. They work for the vehicle industry. Uh, we have a company called AustriaTech that does um, automatic control of traffic inside Vienna. That's their job. Uh, they handle traffic rerouting for cars inside Vienna when there is congestion. Uh, we have um, OASA, a company that runs buses uh, for Athens, the city of Athens. So they're kind of a public held company uh, that does the bus transport for passengers inside. inside um, uh, so we have a number of companies that have transportation related. We have a company called Hopu and Ruventa from Spain, who do supply chains that someone mentioned before, that asked questions about. So we have all these, and the project is about the IoT. So uh, we have developed a method in this project, a new method, for the control of security of an IoT network. But in all of these things, someone said, has be, it been adopted, uh, the challenge is to use as much as possible things which are close to what industry is doing, because if you go too far away, it may be adopted, but the time span may just be too long. Okay, So you want to be not too far from what industry is doing, and you want to kind of be, you be able to use off-the-shelf components. So in this case, we're using um, uh, a software-defined network controller uh, so it's the box on the right-hand side called SER IoT Controller and Routing Engine. It's a machine, fairly powerful machine, that uses something like OpenFlow and which is setting up routes. And uh, why and how is it doing it? Well, it's doing it because we are uh, monitoring in this system uh, three aspects. We're monitoring security, we're monitoring quality of service and we're monitoring energy consumption. And uh, what we want to do is if the security level, in this case represented by S, capital S, large S, is too different from the threshold, and the threshold is how tolerant we are about security, then we want it to give an alarm. Okay, and how does it compute large S? But it's the attack detector says that my probability of attack is 95%. So the value of large S will become 95 at that point. And the threshold can be, well, I will accept a 10% probability of attack. I'm happy with that. But above that, I want a reaction. I want the system to react. So we have this relationship between what is measured by the attack detector large S and what is the system's acceptance, which is large T. And what is F and E? Well, E is a node, and F is a flow. What is a flow? A flow is a connection. It's, for instance, the data going from the IoT device, number 375, and the cloud, number 2. So F is the flow, is the, basically the content that's going from that particular IoT device to the cloud that's monitoring this particular IoT device. And that's it's called flow F. And who is E? E is some particular node. So every node in the system can have this idea of, um, I see this danger, large S, and I have a threshold of acceptance of this danger. Similarly, the flow can have the same. The flow can say, uh, if I go through a node number E, I don't accept a threshold larger than something, sorry, a value of danger larger than something because it's really bad. I only accept that my value of danger is below 5% or something like that. So we have that. And in the then from the, if you wish, the FE, which relates to a node, we can have FP, where P is a path. What's a path? A path is a sequence of nodes. So you sum the I over a path and you get the I for the path. Or you can, and you can, it can either be the sum or it can be the max. For instance, I will look at the max of this and I'm interested, sorry for the R, R is a misprint. Uh, I'm interested in not exceeding uh, the max of these among them. The biggest one is I'm, the one I'm worried about and the biggest one should not be larger than, etc. So we can do that. And these are incorporated into a goal function where we see I, which is related to security, Q, 
which is related to quality of service, E, which is related to energy, and L, which is related to packet loss. So all of these things get built into the goal function, and it is used in an algorithm of the reinforcement learning type. Where? Well, in this uh, architecture. And then the serial controller takes the decisions. So if it sees, for instance, that a, that a flow, which is perfectly legitimate, is going through a certain number of nodes, and one of these nodes security goes beyond something, it's not good, then uh, it reroutes the flow. And if the flow is very sensitive or important, it reroutes the flow so that it avoids this particular node or avoids a set of nodes which are bad. Similarly, if a certain node is, is being used by very important things and there is some flow which is dangerous, then the flow is routed away from that node so that it will not contaminate it. And uh, the decisions will be taken not just for security, but also for quality of service, as I mentioned before. So it is interesting in a system like that to measure a lot of things, you know, how well it is working. So I'm not going to uh, put a lot of measurements for you, but let me put a couple of them or three of them. Uh, the first measurement is up there on top, and it is along the um, uh, x-axis. It's in seconds. Okay, it's in the individual seconds or fractions of seconds. And it is the histogram of the reaction time of the SDN controller. Now, we distinguish between how fast the SDN controller reacts and how fast the system as a whole reacts because the SDN controller then has to give orders to the routers and all the flows have to be reorganized based on a decision. So in this case, we're just showing you one of the points, which potentially could be the bottleneck, which is the SDN controller itself. How fast is it reacting? And it's not too bad. And we see that within a second or so on average, uh, and there are, of course, outliers, there are biggest va bigger values, smaller values, but it's around one second is the SDN controller reaction time. Um, and then uh, the second curve down there is actually all the changes over time. These are real measurements. It's not like some simulates measurement on the, on the test bed. And these are the times when the reinforcement learning is making changes. Uh, so you see these spikes and the reinforcement learning. We're just looking at the changes in reinforcement learning. We're not looking at the values of the goal function. We're just lo looking at the changes and how these changes are happening over time. The next slide is going to show you, I think, uh, the... Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Now, these are changes to quality of service. So, for instance, if the delays are changing, um, all of a sudden, there's a jump to a 100 millisecond delay, which is large inside the network, or a 200 millisecond delay, or a 300 millisecond delay. How quickly uh, is the um, uh, network as a whole uh, reacting? And here you see on the x-axis, you have, you have uh, seconds again. And you see it's not one second anymore. It's tens of seconds. Okay, But what, you see something interesting. You see that um, if the, uh, the it's color coded so uh, light blue is uh, the biggest change in delay 300 milliseconds uh, the uh, light green is a smaller one 200 milliseconds and purple is 100 milliseconds and very nicely you see that as the um, uh, what the bad quality of service is of course when there's a bigger delay well as the quality of service gets worse the system is reacting more quickly. And again, these are measurements, these are uh, histograms, and you see that the histograms are shifted towards the left as the uh, changes in quality of service are worse, which is what you'd expect. You know, corrective action is taken faster as things get worse. So that's, that's nice. And uh, sorry, I have one more slide, I think. I have, of course, many more slides, but one more slide to show you. And this is at the overall system level. So on the y-axis, you have uh, the delay of the reaction. Okay, in um, milliseconds. So how how uh, fast is the 
the system reacting in milliseconds. On the, on the y-axis, you have the system reactions in seconds at the system's level. Okay? So, uh, sorry, on the left-hand side, you have the QoS changes in delay, which are in the milliseconds, and the y-axis is how fast the system is reacting as a whole, not just the controller, but the system completely with the routers, with everything. Okay, the end-to-end -end changes. And you're observing uh, the reality, okay, of one, one experiment. You're seeing that uh, uh, all of a sudden, okay, there was a peak in delay, okay, and uh, quite quickly, uh, the system was rerouted, okay, and so uh, and uh, so when I say quite 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 quickly, it is after all a few seconds. You see the gap. I don't. Uh, you're seeing my finger, I think, or not my finger, my my pointer moving, and you see the gap going between the slides. Okay, is everyone seeing that? And then you see that the delay uh, is low. Okay. And then uh, we see a security change. Now, it's not the security change that creates the delay, but it's the fact that the system is trying to adapt to the security change by finding a better path. It's not very successful in the sense that it's found a more secure path, but the delay is very big. Okay, uh, so it's not good from quality of service perspective. It may be good from security perspective. Then it's found something else. But for some reason, it wasn't happy, perhaps because it felt that the security wasn't good. So it goes up and looks for something else. So this happens a number of times until here. Now, it solved the problem here. It has solved the problem, but it's taken it a long time. It's taken it um, here, 20 seconds, 40 seconds, uh, 60 seconds nearly, or 50 seconds. So nearly one minute later. Uh, the security of the system has been re-established and the performance is also good not just the security but the performance is good so this gives you a sense of how these adaptive schemes um, operate uh, on a real test bed it's not a huge test bed but it's at least it has the merit of having um, around seven eight routers and having a real um, a real uh, sdn controller in the loop so, um, I think I'd like to conclude at this point and then ask for questions again and can go back. Well, cyber attacks are there. They, are, they address all of our societal infrastructure, manufacturing, supply chains, cities, safety, democracy, politics, etc. The other point is there are a great variety of attacks. So, it's, you're not going to solve fairing one solution for everything. You have to go after them case by case, and try to deal with them. Uh, things would be much better if we had international agreements and regulations. We don't. Okay, so uh, basically attackers uh, gets, go scot-free, mostly go scot-free in the internet. Uh, they're here to stay, the, not the attackers and the cyber attacks are here to stay. Okay, everyone is training more human defenders and attackers. Uh, and of course, understanding cyber defense is the same thing as understanding cyber attacks and even in thinking, imagining new cyber attacks. So that's really bad news. Uh, well, IoT, it adds even more complications, unfortunately. So more work for research, more work for engineers, but uh, more problems. Uh, we need to redesign more resilient systems, perhaps through uh, adaptive techniques. The question of the Internet remains open. The question, who, who is going to pay for the research? Well, fortunately, we have the European Union uh, there. But uh, the, the other question is, you know, do we have the right business model for the Internet? That's a huge problem. And we haven't solved it yet. And then... Thank you for listening to me. So we have uh, a few questions. Sure. Um, first one is, can you combine the free attack indicators in one practical tool to maximize correct detections and minimize false alarms? Uh, OK, uh, sensor fusion uh, does not minimize false alarms. 
the idea uh, if you're if you're uh, if you're combining detectors uh, you will typically um, uh, uh, unfortunately uh, if you just try to fuse them in a simple way you will end up uh, reducing the overall accuracy okay so uh, rather than uh, because after all each attack detector is a classifier it's classifying a particular type of attack among all possible attacks. It's selecting one. So rather than fusing, I would view this as better if the software you're imagining was actually uh, classifying attacks and then leading to distinct mitigation techniques based on what kind of attack it is. Okay. So the simple idea of let's put them all in a box and look at the answer globally, unfortunately, is not, I don't think, is the right approach. Um, the next question is, are the false alarms in RNN and other methods the same or partially overlapping? Uh, the, uh, the individual false alarms, the individual false alarms will all be different. So there is no claim that you are getting the same false alarms. But what you're getting is as your method of detection becomes better and more sophisticated, uh, you are reducing the ratio of false alarms. It doesn't really matter. You see, with a false alarm, um, uh, the false alarm has a cost uh, because there are two kinds of costs. One is uh, it may force you to take care of it uh, and you may make something else quite bad because you're doing that, okay? You're pushing the system into a mitigation scheme that leads to costs and perhaps to bad performance on other scales. And so you're getting useless, you're doing useless things and, and sometimes bad things through handling false alarms. But the individual uh, item that is creating the false alarm is due to not just uh, the data itself, you know, the event itself, but it's also due to the memory and the dynamics inside of the algorithm, including what it has learned. Okay, so including its current dynamics and inclu including what it has learned. So there is no simple answer to that question. The, the different false alarms will be typically different from one method to the other, except for the very obvious ones but they will be typically different from one method to the other. And uh, their cost, uh, but, but their cost will be the same, their consequence will be the same. Because you'll say, well, there's an attack of this kind and there was not an attack of this kind. Then you take protective action because of this attack and you may be doing the wrong things, okay? The next question is, how could the flow description be related to the topology of the network? Uh, the flow description is not related to the topology. The flow, the notion of flow is a connection. A connection may use many different paths in the network. Okay. The nodes individually are the E's and those are, it's not the flows that are connected to the topology, it's the E's, uh, which are the nodes which are connected to the topology. And the E's are connected to the large P's which are the paths. Uh, I'll crawl back to the uh, I'm trying to find that particular slide. I think it's this one. Yeah, so F, the flow, is not connected to the topology except by its source and destination. You know, where it's coming from, where it's going to, is the these are the edges of the network. So it's not connected to the topology. The E's are the nodes, they are connected to the topology because every E corresponds to a specific node and the large P is connected to topology. So that is related to a particular path through the network, a sequence of connected nodes, which are part of the topology. But this uh, method is not uh, linked to any particular topology. It will work for any old topology. 
we have another question. Uh, recently, very short DDoS attacks are popular, a minute or less, enough to disrupt the, norm the normal traffic, difficult to detect and block. Have you tested the present uh, presented methods towards short DDoS attacks? Well, all of the data that I have shown you is under uh, one minute. Everything I've shown you is under one minute. It's not based on hours of data. All the tests I gave you, I presented you here. Of course, this is the only thing that's really interesting us is the short attacks. If it lasts for hours, oh, wonderful. We have the time to take care of it and we can discover all kinds of interesting things. But all of these things are based on short sequences. Uh, but within one minute, you can do a lot of things. Question is, how do you modify the learning when the network grows? You don't modify the learning. It says exactly the same. Uh, there's nothing which changes with the size of the network, nor with the topology. This is, this is based on uh, learning at the nodes. It's not learning in a centralized way. And I think we have the last question for now. Uh, can this way of looking at rerouting be applied to biological networks? For example, stroke patients and plasticity of a brain. Uh, yes, uh, so you're suggesting that uh, rerouting around areas of the brain uh, where uh, the uh, functions are reprogrammed. I think the brain does that already to a certain extent. Uh, basically, when someone who has stroke is taught to ex uh, through exercise to move their hand or to do certain actions, perhaps not as perfectly, but uh, they're using, for instance, they're using their uh, motor control uh, neurons, areas of the brain that are involved in motor controls. Basically, the functions are given to new parts of the network. And the technique, uh, I would imagine, that's being used by the brain itself is reinforcement learning. So with the, uh, with the, with the motion, neighboring neurons of the areas which have been impacted initially gets, gets part of the signal getting part of the signal they are activated they don't are they're not in competition with the parts which are not working anymore uh, so they're not inhibited by them and they continue uh, and they're, they're the connection strength are strengthened and then at some point they take over uh, the control so that is i suspect very similar to what we're saying here Hello? Yes, uh, I think we will uh, now uh, give the voice back to our director, Marek Michalevich. Uh, yes, we can see you, Marek. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I wish to thank Errol, uh, Professor Galembe. It was uh, very, very uh, enlightening, very interesting, and uh, extremely current. You know, for, as you said, uh, it is not going to go away. And we have to constantly learn ourselves by using new methods and uh, new uh, analysis and applying new tools. And, uh, and uh, I can assure all that, uh, and I know that uh, Jaroslav Skomio is in the audience, that uh, he asked the question, that uh, we experience uh, those problems ourselves. We, we are, our, our network, our facilities are subject to attacks and, uh, and we have to constantly be on guard and look for very practical means of, of uh, protecting ourselves and uh, our services. And of course, uh, as, uh, as uh, Errol said, uh, it costs a lot of money. It costs the uh, reputation, and uh, which is uh, priceless. Can't attach uh, any cost to that. It, and uh, and uh, also uh, in terms of disappointment and, and the lack of uh, trust of uh, users and, and the customers in the provider of services that are undermined by attacks. So that's extremely important. Uh, we, of course, will be looking carefully into the results of, uh, of Professor Galembe's various projects. And uh, I'm sure that in the developing IoT, a world full of IoT, uh, all those uh, findings will, will, will be crucial, very important. 
So thank you very much. I, I thank you on behalf of all uh, listeners. Uh, and uh, I would love to continue this discussion at the research level. And for, for, for the uh, listeners, for participants of today's uh, uh, seminar, uh, thank you for your presence. Uh, thank you for your interest. Uh, please spread the word to, uh, to your colleagues, friends, students, uh, network that we are running those sort of uh, seminars to, to share the knowledge, to, to, to discuss, to learn, first of all, uh, of course, and also in a certain sense to entertain also in a more intellectual sense uh, during the time of when, when we are all sort of confined in the home offices, we have to keep uh, in the social isolation. So we don't want to sort of get uh, too depressed about, the, about that, I hope. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, information uh, today, right now, about next week's seminars. Uh, I'll be trying to secure next speaker. It's, uh, it's uh, in a certain sense ad hoc uh, uh, activity, and it's not so easy to 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 secure uh, the highest quality uh, sort of uh, thought leader to to speak on a very short uh, notice. But uh, I can assure that I'll be doing my best. I do have few exceptional speakers on my sort of uh, wish list, and uh, I've already have a speaker, uh, Professor Sarah Kenderdean, fixed uh, for June. So please mark your calendar for the 10th of June. We'll have uh, digital humanities, digital museums, digital uh, three dimensional interactive. Uh, um, exhibitions of uh, cultural uh, and historical values of extremely interesting, ex uh, extremely entertaining, uh, eye-opener. Uh, in the meantime, I, I can also ensure that uh, that uh, we might also have some, uh, some uh, excellent uh, speakers continue with the first two, of course. Uh, we would like to, to keep this, this uh, quality, this, this uh, excellent value in our seminar so thank you very much and please please watch watch this space announcements and uh, and uh, i wish that we'll be meeting uh, you at our seminars weekly thank you very much